from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Radio 2018. Brought to you by VMware. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Radio 2018. We are in San Francisco for their VMware's Radio 2018. It's their R&D um, fiesta, party. Um, as Steve Harrod said, former CTO, it's like a sales kickoff for engineers. It's a great time, but it's also serious. A lot of real serious discussion. And of course, people are flexing their technical muscle and stretching their minds. And I'm here with one of the, the chief operator, one of the main principals and legend in VMware, Raghu Raghuram, chief operating officer, new title, chief operating officer, products and cloud services. That's right. Great to see you. I mean, great you, to see you, John. What year did you join VMware? 2003. <laughs> so you've years. seen many of these radios. Yes, it's one of the highlights of the year for me. Yeah, super uh, important architect of, of VMware, great part of the community leader. Um, architect of the AWS relationship. Sure. Um, part of that, moving with Andy Jassy, Sanjay Poonin. This is the 14th year of radio, and VMware has changed a lot since you joined. It's now yep. a world-class organization, um, getting check mark marks for one of the best places to work, certainly for engineers. It's yep. like a great yep. party environment. Take yep. a minute to explain the radio culture. It's 14th year, there's t-shirts behind us that commemorate yep. the key milestones, yep. where it's come from, where it's gone, your thoughts on the program and the community. Yeah, I mean, this is in fact one of the unique characteristics of VMware. I've checked around with my peers in the industry and I don't think any other tech company of our size does this. Uh, radio stands for R&D Innovation Offsite. And uh, like you said, we started 14 years ago um, just to take the bunch of engineers out from their daily grinds and say, what could we be building? Fundamentally, that's uh, groundbreaking. And uh, so I would say it's a, it's a cross between a wild science fair and a research conference. And in fact, both of these go hand in hand at this, uh, at this place. Uh, people publish papers, and there is a selection committee just like in serious conferences. And in fact, Ray had some amazing stats uh, for this year's submissions, and the selection is very, very rigorous. At the same time, you'll go upstairs and you'll see the uh, exhibition hall where there are all kinds of things that are um, displayed. Things that could be very well incremental things in the next release and things that are wild and wacky off the wall that we might ever, never ever do. So it's really the full gamut. The other interesting thing is if you've gone bigger, uh, we are getting people from pretty much all parts of VMware. And uh, I think there is a representation from 25 How many 30 engineering countries. centers are there? Roughly, I mean, there's core, there's core centers, and then you have engineers all over the world. How many engineers? Ballpark? I mean, I would say, in terms of medium to big size centers, there are probably over a dozen across the globe, and literally every continent. Clearly, in the U.S., we have uh, four big centers. In Europe, we have uh, um, three at least, and in uh, Asia Pac, we have uh, another three or four. So, we definitely have over ten. Yeah. I mean, everyone who knows VMware and also knows theCUBE for nine years, but this is our ninth year covering VMworld. Yep. All you got to do is look at VMworld and you can tell one thing right out of the gate. Very community oriented. Yep. All the decisions are made in the community. Also, people who know VMware know you're highly an engineering organization. Yep. This is not like a lot of marketing fluff, although yep. you do have some good marketing here and yep. there, but yep. the point is it's an engineering culture yep. with community. This is unique. Yep. I've seen companies that walk don't walk the talk on, quote, community engineering. Yeah, yeah. They have silos, there's a lot of infighting. Yep. How have you, how has VMware preserved a culture of innovation uh, amongst their peers when it's competitive as hell inside VMware? One, to be smart, achieve the success, but also VMware's always been in always a moving market. Yeah. How do you guys do? What's the secret sauce? I mean, there's not a single thing. Like you said, I think culture is something that happens over time, it is preserved over time, and is preserved through people. It's not like anything you can write down, right? Of course you can write it down, but uh, it won't be worth the paper it's written down unless it's practiced every day by the people. And so I think that is the key thing here. Uh, right from the get-go, customer-centric innovation has ruled the roost here. So the question to ask always is, okay, Great innovation, look at it from a customer end point of view. I think that matters a lot here. Secondly, uh, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on 
breaking the rules in terms of doing something disruptive, right? And the engineers that come here are, tend to be the kind that respond to that, right? And then lots of venues, like this is not the only thing that we do, right? We yeah. do these things called borathons, which is our internal versions of hackathons. We do regional versions of these things. Each of the teams, like the business units, have their own little uh, R&D, I mean, uh, innovation activities that go on. They have it's a playground, a they, can, they, they can basically go outside the scope of their job. Exactly. Get an idea, a passion, an idea, and go after it, not yep. have to worry about anything. Yep, yep, exactly. And we have With a pretty, path to commercialization, if the Yeah, hits. that's what I was going to say. We have a fairly high success rate, I would say, of taking things that we see here and turning them into product and eventually into monetizable businesses or things that go into the product features, right? Give some examples of historically successes, notables, and then also talk about some ones that aren't notable that have come out. I mean, I know a, lot, a lot's come out of this. The numbers are, are, are clear. What are some highlights that have come out of the radio event that have been blockbuster successes? I mean, a lot of the things that you see in the networking today came out of radio, right? Things about doing um, security and networking from the hypervisor up came from here. Uh, what you see today as vSAN had its roots here, right? Uh, what you see today with the app defense and the security stuff had its roots here. Um, a lot of the features that are in uh, vSphere today, right? Uh, especially the storage, vMotion, and so on and so forth, was first showcased here. And this goes on and on and on, right? Uh, we also have, uh, um, there are a lot of things that have shown up here that we have not pursued. Um, there was, for example, almost like an eBay for VM capacity, and we didn't pursue it. But God knows that could have been a huge idea, right? <laughs> so, um, there's some misses too. Yeah, there's some misses too. But that's the whole point of this. So. Yeah. And it sparks the creativity. How much is creativity um, goes on at this event? I mean, certainly a lot of barnstorming, brainstorming, well, what do you want to call it? A lot of interaction, physical face-to-face. -face. Um, how much creativity is happening, do you think, here? Yeah, so a few years back, uh, uh, they introduced a couple of things. One is an instant birds of a feather, where you can literally go to a whiteboard and say, hey, let's discuss this topic, and set up a time, and then people show up. And then there's this uh, other one that they call lightning rounds, which literally happens over drinks, I think tomorrow or something, where people come in and it's a lot of a mini gong show where nothing's scripted, all sorts of crazy ideas keep flowing. I would say those are two examples where um, there's a lot of on-the-spot creativity, right? And also as the companies and the R&D teams have gotten more dispersed, this is an opportunity for people to get together even within the same business unit or across business units and say, let's go solve this problem. You and I have been talking about this on email, let's talk about it face to face, and hey, let's bring somebody else in that's uh, relevant to this conversation as well. So those are the kind of things that um, uh, go on here that spark the creativity. And then of course, uh, the exhibits, when people start talking, thinking about these exhibits and talking to people that are showing there, other ideas get spawned off as well. Regu, talk about, just from your experience, so you had a lot of great track record, in, and certainly within VMware, it goes back to you know, the early 2000s, what is your observation on the innovation formula? What's been the consistent constant of innovation? I mean, as the waves have changed, and certainly, I mean, I've been in Palo Alto for 19 years now, in my 20th year, even Palo Alto's changed. And, yeah. you know, so the world's changed, modern, and we'll get to the Amazon deal in a second, certainly clouds here. Um, what have you seen as the constant innovation variable? I mean, um, what I would say is this, uh, fundamentally the people that we tend to recruit into VMA are by and large what we call, what I, at least I call platform thinkers. So they think of building a fundamental piece of technology that can be used, possibly used in 10 different ways, right? And they build it for one particular use case. And then the question goes back to, okay, now we have done this, what else can we do with this foundational technology? And if you look at, vSphere is the same thing. If you look at networking, it's the same thing. Storage is the same thing. So I would say that is the constant. That's one constant here, right? Which is how do you build fundamentally a platform that can be used in fundamental, very different ways? I mean, some will also say systems thinking. 
I mean, exactly. the cloud so a is a system. Yep. I mean, because the cloud has been operating. I, mean, I think, you know, Paul Moritz is a 2010 picture, although some of the calls didn't come out, but he kind of generally had the architecture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he nailed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there are only few people like Paul in the world, and absolutely, he yeah. nailed it. Yeah, yeah, Dave and I would give him a lot of credit for that. Okay, let's talk about Amazon Web Services. Certainly radio's now 14th year. At what point did the cloud start clicking in? You said there's some misses to eBay for VMs. Um, certainly cloud is on the radar. Yeah. And vCloud, we know what happened there. Pat talked about how you guys really took that opportunity, which is you made lemonade out of some lemons there with that product. That's my words, not his. Um, when did cloud first appear on the horizon in radio? Yeah. And when now, how do you see that happening now as we talk multi-cloud? Yeah, so um, you missed uh, uh, the alumni session today, and one of the early engineers said when he was interviewed by Mendel, which was in 1999, right? Uh, Mendel is of course the yep. founder and chief scientist, the first, time, uh, first chief scientist here. Um, he said he for, foresaw a day when, when the engineer asked him how are we going to make money on this, right? He thought there'll be a day when people just rent compute capacity from a data center instead of going out and buying gear, right? And so in some ways, he predicted, he predicted cloud it back operations. When, it's, uh, uh, when it's back in the company starting days, right? But really I think um, we saw this in 2005, 2006, 2007, at the same time actually as uh, Amazon saw this, yeah. right? But the big difference was we were growing 100% a year on our core business and we had our hands full that way, right? And we felt like as a software company, the way to play it is by delivering technology to other people to build it. So yeah. that's when it really made its way here, right, in radio and in the products. And by the way, it wasn't obvious to many people in the industry at that time to Amazon. I've had many conversations with Andy Jassy, and he always, now he uses the term, you know, being misunderstood. I mean, they were completely misunderstood. Unless you were an entrepreneur, who was using EC2s yeah. to avoid you know, seed money, Yeah. because it was a dream for entrepreneurs at yeah. that time, yeah. I remember that clearly. That was not obvious. Yeah. It really wasn't obvious until about 2010, exactly. 9, 10, there. So you guys were growing, okay, missed that. But I mean, radio is not about missing, it's about identifying. Exactly. So how does it translate today for Amazon? So um, the Amazon relationship, um, if you think about the technical underpinnings of it, right? Clearly we did vCloud Air, we learned a lot of that. Then within our, um, some of our engineers, the question that was asked was, what if, we what if we could run a cloud on top of other people's clouds, right? And we did experiments with nested virtualization, we did experiments with bare metal, and then we chose this sort of a model, right? Um, so that's, uh, I would say, one of the technical early indicators of what we could do on other people's clouds. So that's, uh, I would say, a big thing. And the rest of the things that we're doing with respect to elastically growing capacity and all those things came from the uh, uh, experiments that were shown up here. So that was the roots connection back to radio. In terms of the Amazon partnership itself, that was, uh, a lot of it was driven from the customer end. As we were thinking about VCA not working the way we wanted it to work, we went back to the customers and said, look, what is wrong with this picture? Mm -hmm. And the answer that came back was very clear. They said, we like the hybrid idea, but we want the hybrid to be VMware on-prem and Amazon in the cloud, because 70% yeah. of our customers turned out to be AWS customers. And at the same time, AWS is hearing the same thing. Why don't you guys team up instead of being an either or, right? And that's what led to the partnership, actually. And your team at VMware, Kane, was the cloud native piece? Yeah aspect of it. Yep. So obviously Kubernetes is on the horizon, yep. but not on the horizon, in your face, and you've got service mesh over the top. Yep, yep. I mean, yep. it's up to stack, it's networking. Yep, exactly. It still needs to do networking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you guys must be like, hey, we love what's going on up yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Come down to the store. Yeah, so the boundary between what is application platform and infrastructure platform is constantly changing, right? And uh, Kubernetes, when it started out, people said, oh, is it a, it's an application platform. Now it turns out it's actually infrastructure. And similarly, same thing in networking. So what we see is things that were at the lower level of the infrastructure constructs, the same idea is applying at the next level up. Yeah. That's why we love Kubernetes, we love service mesh, 
we love similar concepts that are coming about in storage and security yeah. and so on and so forth. A unified stack is coming. Yep, exactly. It's just someone fixed networking and then the holy grail, programmable networks. Yep. When are they coming? At the application level. Let's go. Yeah. Holy grail's finally here. It's not where you thought it was going to be. It is at both places, right? Yeah. I mean, it's tying back to the uh, conventional layer two, layer three stuff because that's, that's also important still. Rego, I love having a chat with you. It's great to chat. Good to see Super you again, Super impressive John. with the work you've been doing. I love the cloud deal with yep. Amazon, you know that. Yep. Love what's going on in Kubernetes and, and, and containerization. Yep. Love yep. what's going on in ServiceNash, Unified Stack. Love cryptocurrency, which I didn't get to ask you. Yep. Thumbs you got up. Crazy things going on there too. Thumbs up, okay, thumbs More up. More blockchain on than cryptocurrency. But blockchain, yeah. token economics coming right behind it. It's theCUBE bringing you all the action here at Radio. We're the signal. 2018, Radio 2018, I'm theCUBE. With Raghu, I'm gonna be right back with more coverage after this short break. <laughs>